Okay, so, um, and that's very typical, like uh, putting some uh, print statement uh, to see like what, what is happening in my code. So uh, sprinkling some uh, prints or uh, setting up setting up a breakpoint and then looking up what is the current state of the program. So the whole lecture is to tell you, don't do that, <laughs> okay? Um, because you're doing it for the wrong reason. So uh, we will kind of go back to it, but the, the whole point is, it's kind of a waste of time if you're doing this. Um, because it, it kind of requires a human uh, labor and that human labor is not kind of a, um, repeatable in a sense that you kind of, if you like, oh, you, you may say, yeah, we can say like if debug, um, then do those prints. Otherwise the debug is false and then it can stay in the code, right? So we sometimes have the approach where we put asserts, um, we put asserts or we put this kind of a structure um, and that kind of has a place. Of course, it's it's legit legitimate to do that sometimes, uh, but most of the time uh, you cannot see. You cannot see, all right, let me share again. Yeah. Uh, can you see now? There is no green. Uh, Let me see. Now, yes, sure. Can Zoom people confirm that you can see the screen? Yes, great. Um, so it is like you can make it kind of beneficial by doing the asserts and if debug, which stays in the code, but uh, most of the time we do it for the wrong reason, okay? So we, we will discuss a little bit when to do it and when not to do it and how to deal with it in Haskell. But because the lecture is gonna be relatively short, I thought, yeah, let's do a little bit of a review. <laughs> so we will do a bit of a review first. So please join in. Okay. Obviously, reading the code on a on the slides is a little bit cumbersome, but imagine that those lines are in a single line. So Well, so many people fall a victim of uh, a little bit of a misconception with the with the binding and the function. So what we were doing, what we are doing here, we're doing a visual inspection, right? We kind of looking at the code and trying to mentally analyze what's going on, right? So what's going on in here is we have a value which is wrapped in the maybe monad. Then we have a bind and bind needs a function. And what is the problem with this with this line of code? So let's uh, have a quick look. So so let's let me do this. Okay, so we have we have Justin. 
and it's bind with the plus uh, function plus 20. So it's gonna blow up, right? It's gonna tell us, well, there is an error. Uh, so we could um, read the error and the error is actually confusing uh, because the error is about the GHCI not being able to print us something, right? So it's like the code looks fine. It's just that the uh, GHCI cannot print the results for us, right? So if I, if I did this, if I said A, equals this, it will actually work, right? Which is like, okay. <laughs> so what is A? A is something that GHCI cannot print for us, right? And GHCI always has problem printing stuff which involves functions. So if I say, for example, A is plus 20, or, right? If I, if I tell GHCI that A is a uh, carry, which is plus 20, it will say, yeah, fine. I, I, I know what you mean. If I say A, you know, 10, it will say, yep, yeah, it's 30 because A is a function, which is which is a plus 20. And now we're passing a missing argument and it will be fine. But if I tell it to print, to show me what A is, it will say, no, I, I cannot show you what A is. A is a function and I don't know how to, to print functions, right? So with our original problem, uh, with our, our original problem, it, it is doing something, but it is not doing what we think it is doing, right? So A is something which involves a function. Um, and therefore, uh, GHCI cannot print it. So what the bind normally takes, um, let's see. If I say, show me what bind normally takes is it takes a value in a monad and it takes a function which converts a normal value into a value in a monad. So what is plus 20? Well, we can see it again, plus 20. Um, oh, come on. Okay, let's do a trick. So let's say A is plus 20. And then we'll ask what is A. So plus 20 is a single argument function which converts type A into type A. And we need a function which takes A and produces monadic value. So this is not fitting into the bind, right? So we, we need something which actually fits into the bind. Um, and plus 20 is not such a function because plus 20 takes A and returns A. And what we need is some a function which takes A and returns a maybe something or a monadic value of something, right? So in our case, if this M is a maybe monad, we would expect a function which produces a, and maybe something, right? So in that case, this is not a correct answer because this is a wrong function. This function takes A and produces A. When do we use those types of functions? When those functions are useful? Well, those functions are useful when we're doing, um, when we're using this operator. Uh, right? Because this function or map takes a function from A to B. So it is kind of the useful function for mapping things uh, because we just need a, a, a normal pure function. There is no F in here. It takes a value wrapped in a functor and produces a new value wrapped in a functor, but the function is pure. So in with a map, like with the F map, map, and this guy, uh, we can use normal functions from A to A or from A to B. But with bind, we have to have from A to M. So that's why this is a correct and very um, idiomatic way of doing this. This also is correct. 
but this one is correct for the wrong reason. Um, this one is correct for the wrong reason because maybe is both a functor and monad, right? And pure produces as a functor, applicative functor out of this function, which actually happens to be a monad as well. And that's why the bind works with this monad here and with the pure here. Uh, but normally we should use return uh, because it converts a function or converts a value into a, a, a monadic dropped value, right? So if I have, in our case, if I have this A, remember, yeah, I cannot print what A is, <laughs> but if I say what A is, you remember A is plus 20, right? It's from A to A. And if I say return A for me, it's gonna uh, produce B. And then if I ask what B is, it says, well, it's a function now, which is inside a monadic uh, context, right? It's still a function from A to A, but it is wrapped in the monadic context. So we don't really want to return A because we don't, you see this signature, um, this signature doesn't fit what we need neither. Um, we need to map A and we need to return MA. So we have to return the, re the value which was returned from the running the function, right? So we want B to be returned combined with A such that we run A first, we convert from A to B from A from you know 10 to 30 plus plus 20, and then we wrap the result, right? So now if I check what B is, now it has the correct signature, right? It's from normal value to M value. So, well, I will show you again. So by doing this, so there is a difference between doing return A, which drops the, the function itself and doing return combined with the result of A, which is doing this for us. Okay, so that was kind of a longish explanation. Who understands that? Who understands why this one is a wrong answer and why this one is the idiomatic correct answer? I understand, but the return is not supposed to be used to return something at the end of a function? No. Okay. So return is never really used to return something out of the function because the function is always an expression and the evaluation of that expression is what the function returns. So you don't need to put return anywhere in functions because they always return whatever the expression evaluates to. You put return in a do block when you want to quit or return from the do expression, what is the outcome of the do expression? Then you use the uh, return, but do expressions are always in the context of a monad. Um, and in, in this case, we are working in the context of a monad because we are wrapping this uh, value, which is 10 plus 20, which is 30. And we want to wrap it inside the monad, which we are currently in. And this monad, which we are in is the maybe monad because we have adjust as a, as a value, as an initial value to it, right? So what is the difference between the return and pure? Return is for the monads. It returns the wrapped value for the monadic context. And pure is wrapping a context into applicative functor, right? And maybe it's both. So in maybe monad, it, it, both are doing the same thing because in, in this case, it's just 30. And in this case, it's just 30 because they are basically the same thing. Why this one is wrong? Because the bind needs a value on the left-hand side and the function on the right-hand side. Uh, why this one is wrong? For the same reason this one is wrong, because the value is on the wrong side. And why this one is wrong? Because this one, this function doesn't fit into the signature of what bind expects, right? So this is the idiomatic answer, uh, the, the number two. Okay, not, not too great so far, <laughs> but hopefully with all those explanations, we'll be doing better. All right, so let's see.
What's the result of this line of code? Perfect. Much better. If you don't, if you don't know, what you can do is you can obviously copy that um, and paste it into your GCI. So let's quit that. Let's clear the screen. Let's restart this. All right. So um, yeah, I copied the text as well. All right. Sorry, uh, so again, we have it at the bottom. <laughs> uh, so just 10 bound with return plus 20. Okay, yeah, just 30. So you can confirm what you what you all visually inspected here, that it works, perfect. Um, so just one more, one more comment, like what would that be? That would be something else because now we're wrapping the function in the monadic context. So the signature doesn't fit. So binding kind of now doesn't kind of cannot do what it's supposed to do. And it, and the error message, if you compile it with the compiler will be different to when you try to run it with the, uh, oh, it's not too bad actually. Um, so it kind of tries to explain that um, it expects a function which is um, from a normal value to a maybe value, right? So it expects on in here a function with this signature, but what it got is a carry, which takes um, a value and another value and returns the value, which was kind of a pass as a second argument, right? So it says, yeah, the type doesn't match. You're doing something weird, right? Um, because we, now have a monadic context inside with the A to A, right? So we have this um, monadic context of A to A. Uh, those are types. Th th those are not that it's the same value. It's the value of the same type, basically. Um, yeah, reading error messages, it's not trivial in Haskell, unfortunately. Um, so, but most people got that right. So that's good. So let's do one more. Okay, this one should be easy. It's about terminology. You have an expression. This kind of a long expression. What is a monadic value? Yep. So just 30 is a monadic value. So the return uh, out of those, the whole expression is a monadic value, but also the first one, just 10 is also a monadic value, right? So just 10 is a correct answer. And the whole thing evaluated to just 30 is correct as well. Um, 10 is not because 10 is just a normal number. It's not a monadic value. Um, 20 is the same. Th those are just normal numbers. Um, to be a monadic value, you have to be wrapped in a monadic context. Uh, return is just a function. Um, and this is a function, so this is not a value. Okay. One more. No, no, not more. So uh, we're doing... Yeah, some people are doing better than some other people. Uh, I want to go back just for a second. Uh, this part here. So this is bind, right? This one is bind. This one is a monadic value. And this one is a monadic function. So this one. So um, something, so if I ask uh, what is return, it says return takes a normal value and returns as a value wrapped in a monadic context. 
That's a signature of a monadic function. So monadic functions are functions which take a value and return a, a monadic um, value. So if I say return plus 20, and if I call it, let's call it B, uh, and then if I ask what B is, it will say, yeah, it's a function which takes B, which happens to be a number, and returns MB. So this B now is a monadic function as well, right? So return is a monadic function, but combination of return and a pure function is also a monadic function because the signature is correct. But if I said, as we did before, if we do A and ask what A is, that one is not a monadic function because it's a normal function in a monadic context and it's not a monadic function, right? So yeah, it's a little bit tedious, but you, you kind of need to get the vocabulary in, and the, the terminology correct as well, part of the course objectives. All right, so is that clear now? Monadic value, bind, monadic function. Monadic function needs to take a normal value and produce something wrapped in the context. Perfect. Okay, so now let's go back to debugging a little bit. Oh no, not yet. When do we use a function pure? Uh, still quizzes. It's an open, open, open-ended question. So when do we use pure? When would you use pure? Noticeably, it's a little bit confusing because you would use pure in C++, for example, to indicate that the function is pure. What does it mean that the function is pure? No side effects. So for the same input, it always produces the same output. That means the function is pure. Um, most functions in Haskell are pure. Haskell functions are pure unless you say they are IO functions and they are impure, right? So by default, all functions in Haskell are pure. Um, so the pure <laughs> function is a little bit confusing because it, it's only used in the context of the applicative functor, um, right? So when do we use pure? Any suggestions? We can go and check. What's the signature of pure? Well, a signature of pure says, give me a value and I will wrap it inside an applicative functor for you, right? So if I say pure 10, and if I operate within the context of maybe int monad, uh, maybe int applicative functor, then it will say just 10, right? So if I don't specify the type, the uh, interpreter will say, yeah, I don't know what you mean. Like uh, there are so many different applicative functors. I don't know which one I should put your 10 into, right? H how to wrap, right? So it will uh, say, actually it doesn't complain, just say 10 because it couldn't um, pick any, but you can enforce it by saying maybe int. So then it, it uses just. Um, another applicative factor that you know is either, right? So you can say either string int, and then it will say right then, right? Because pure always pick the right side. Uh, the left side is for the failures. The correct one is the right side. So it will wrap it into the right side. Um, so, yeah, so no. <laughs> so not to check if the value is pure. We uh, use pure in Haskell to wrap a normal value into an applicative functor, right? Um, another applicative functor that you know is list. So for example, you can say wrap me 10 into a list and it, uh, and it will say, um, yeah, that didn't work that well. Um, 
How about if I try to coerce this one to a list? Ah, yeah, yeah, I know. That, that was probably what we were doing is probably correct, but we need, because yeah, the error says, I gave it a list, but the list has a kind, like it's a generic type. It's not specific type. It's a type that you have to make specific by providing an additional type variable, right? So now it will work, right? So now I'm kind of, I have a normal number. I have a number 10 and I want to wrap it into a context of applicative functor and list of ints is an applicative functor. So I can kind of uh, coerce it, like convert it to a wrapped context by doing pure. So pure is for wrapping something into an applicative functor, right? Like, like a list. And it basically is a list with 10 inside. All right. And then when we do use return. So I will not wait for your answer. I will just tell you that it's exactly the same, but for the monad, right? So if you look at the pure again, pure takes an applicative functor, right? Applicative functor F and takes a normal value and returns you the value wrapped in this applicative functor. And return is... Um, exactly the same, but it, it's using a monad, right? So now we wrapping, we take a normal value and wrap it into a monadic context, right? So if we use the same examples, because a list of ints is also a monad, it will work the same way. And because either is also a monad, um, it will work exactly the same. And maybe is also a monad and it will work exactly the same. But return operates um, on a monadic context and um, pure operates on the applicative functor context. Okay. Okay, still two, two more questions about quizzes. So, Please join in. We will do another visual inspection of the code. So we have an expression and what will this expression result in? Is that expression well-formed? Is it a compiler warning? Is it 30, just 30, or just 200 plus? Obviously, I will copy that. Oh, come on, you people. Nobody got it right. So I, I paste it here. Again, I paste it with some text, the go to blah, blah, blah. So at the bottom, we say plus, map plus to this just 10, and then do this fancy apply to this another uh, applicative um, value, right? So we have two applicative values. We have f map, and we have the normal function. And we have the apply operator, which we learned last time how, how to call it. We, we learned that we call it apply. So if I execute it, it says just 30, right? So it works fine. Everything is perfectly well mapped, right? So remember like this one, the F map, uh, that F map, if you say F map and you pass it a normal function and you pass it a, value wrapped in the applicative functor context, it will map this function to the value and give you the value in the context, right? So this one will work, but this one will return us a function wrapped in a maybe monad, right? Uh, which the GHCI cannot print. So I have to do this trick again with um, B, All right? So it actually is a function like what, so it's a just function with plus 10, right? So this is a normal value, like uh, 10 is a normal value. 
um, it's wrapped inside the applicative functor context. And now we mapping this function, which takes two arguments to this single argument to 10, right? So if we do that, we're gonna get a carry, right? If we apply, like if we map the plus operator to this number, we're gonna get plus 10. And this plus 10 function is wrapped inside the just, right? So if we do this part, we're gonna get just plus 10. And then that, that's fine. Uh, it, it doesn't know how to print functions, right? The, the interpreter complains about not being able to print as functions like this arrow thing. So now if I ask what is, uh, can you tell me what is this operator? It says, well, this operator ta takes a function which is wrapped inside the mon um, applicative functor context and an applicative value and gives you a new applicative value with this being transformed. So it sneaks in the function into your value inside the context, right? So if we do this and apply it to another applicative value, it's gonna give us 30, just 30. And then if we un unwrap, like uh, if we do this first, then we will have this on the left-hand side. And then we do this with just 20, we're gonna get 30. So that's how this works. Right, so this is a correct code. Everything is perfectly fine. Uh, we're doing fmap first. We're doing the apply afterwards. And we're applying this um, normal function in the applicative context into this applicative value. You need to spend some time with this. Like you do need to uh, uh, stir it a little bit. So then we have one more. So what we use map, apply, and pure with? When do we use them? Or when we do use them with? 100% correct answer this time, come on. Almost 60%. <laughs> no, those are applicative functors. Yeah, fmap, apply, and pure, applicative functors. Okay, and then the con complementary question. Bind and return. Okay, 100% now. Now you know the answer. Yes, there are some distractors. Of course, there are some distractors, but you know the answer. You can do it. Uh, 75% monads, of course. So bind and return with monads, mm -hmm. map and uh, pure and apply with applicative functors. Perfect. All right, so let's recheck here. Oh, some people gave up and some people are doing pretty well. All right. So here we have a more um, more longer piece of code. And again, we're doing visual inspection. So now we're getting a little bit more into the debugging. So, you know, uh, will, will, will that code work? Okay, again, you know, I would copy that. So I would say data student, okay. I will copy that to my GCI. So I will say there is a type data student, which is defined as this, and that works. And then I would say there is M, which is defined like this.
Oi, 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 come on. Um, yeah. Uh, because of the end of line, it's kind of uh, making it confusing, right? So now I have M. So I have defined the student type and I have defined M and we don't have any errors. So up to up to this line, we have no problems, okay? Uh, I spent already some time like putting that into GHCI and kind of validating that those things are correct, right? Um, if you learn like, uh, inspecting that visually, that would be saving you time, right? So to, to save time, you can just look at it and say, yeah, uh, the syntax look good. There is data type, uh, there is a, you know, a type constructor, and then I have two fields, the types are correct, there is a comma, looks fine, right? Uh, no problems here. With let, yeah, that looks fine as well. I'm assigning string to name and h to h. It's an int, yes, it's all good. Maybe the compi compiler will kind of complain that this is multi uh, polymorphic type, but it will not complain because the compiler knows that it has to be an int, right? So it's a, is it an int? Yeah, it, it is. it could be an int. So the compiler will not complain. So now we have the last line of code and will that work, right? So now will that work or not? Again, it's super trivial to see it. Uh, but if you don't see it, who's, who sees if it will work or not? Okay, who else sees? So what do you see? Exactly, it will not work because we didn't define how to show um, th this type, right? So even though the M is fine, the student is fine, if we say print M, it will blow up. It will say, well, there is no instance for show student, right? Um, so just looking at the code, you will know, yes, there is a missing deriving. Like we didn't uh, put deriving here, right? So if I recall my student definition, and if I say the deriving show, and if I just de define my M to be whatever it was, and now I say print M, now everything will work fine because we kind of have the show method and print needs to convert the M to something that is a string, right? So print is doing, is doing show M first and then it's printing that string, right? Um, so by doing this interaction with GHCI, you will kind of discover that there is a bug, right? But it is much more efficient to discover that there is a bug by just doing a visual inspection, by just looking at the code and saying, yeah, yeah, there is a missing deriving. Sometimes you don't see it. And sometimes you have to do some debugging. You have to actually evaluate things for yourself. But if you kind of train yourself to see that there is a bug, like uh, like Austin did, then you kind of know that, um, you know, I'm, I'm just missing it, right? Um, the IDE highlights kind of a lot of typos and a lot of small mistakes. It will not highlight that mistake, right? It, it will be the compiler telling you that you didn't define show. Um, okay, next one. Um, okay, so the next one was actually I missed this. I missed the... <laughs> I missed the uh, the question. So the question was, was the code code correct, right? Um, so you watch, you you've seen the code, and now the question was, was the code correct? And uh, obviously the answer was that it wasn't. Um, so there will be no changes here. Okay, so debugging. Um, let's discuss first what debugging is. Okay. So what are the um, what are the terms that we use often in a software construction? So the first one is benchmarking. What what is that? There was a short discussion on benchmarking on the programming uh, chat. So what do you think benchmarking is, and when do you use benchmarking? Any. Uh, you don't have to type, you can just say. When do you use, when, yeah? The first week in this extension, I remember there was something about uh, measuring the performance of both the application and a specific part. Yeah. 
So, so the word benchmarking comes from a, 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 um, a noun uh, benchmark, right? A benchmark is some sort of indicator, some sort of number usually, which indicates how fast something is or how much RAM something uses or how many calls something does, whatever. So at the end of the day, it's some sort of measure, some sort of metric, right? So when you're doing benchmarking, you want to calculate some sort of metric. And this metric, you can recalculate in different conditions just to compare things, right? So we often do benchmarking for CPUs, right? We have Intel, you know, core, whatever, uh, CPU, and we run some standard benchmarks on it. And then we compare it with AMD or with ARM. And we say that CPU is faster or performing better with uh, graphical applications or floating point numbers because the benchmarks give you numbers like for different things, like for doing floating point operations or for doing integer operations or whatever, right? Uh, so we calculate some sort of metric. So it is a measure of performance. It could be a measure of performance in terms of time. It could be a measure of performance in terms of uh, memory usage and so on and so forth, right? Um, and as we discussed in the uh, uh, discussion there, some languages come with the benchmark kind of built in. So you can write some little tests and they will run certain code multiple times, like a hundred times, and they will calculate an average and they will tell you this average, right? Usually for a benchmark, we have to run something multiple times because if you run something once, you only get one value and that may not be representative of what something takes, like how long something takes. Um, so benchmarks we do to estimate some sort of measure, okay? What is profiling? When we do profiling, come on, guys, you had the lecture on it. Uh, per Morton came here and he spent like, you know, two days with you on this topic, right? And he even gave you some of his own profiler he wrote for collecting stats, right? So what is profiling? Profiling is um, investigating performance but understanding the causes of a particular performance indicator, right? When you do benchmarking, you don't care like how something is implemented. You only care about the benchmark, about the final metric. When you're doing profiling, you're collecting traces, you're collecting statistics, you're collecting things in order to understand where is the bottleneck? Like what is consuming the most RAM? What is the slowest function in your program? Why the program takes 10 seconds? Like out of different functions, which one is the slowest? So profiling is, um, yeah, exactly. It's like you, you're trying to find out what the bottlenecks are and where you need to optimize. Uh, where are the sources of your benchmark results, right? So when you're doing benchmarking, you kind of don't care where the number comes from. You only care about the number. So when you say, there is a benchmark for Intel CPU and the number is 3,800, right? And then for AMD, it's like 4,500, right? You don't know why AMD is uh, slower than Intel, but you know AMD is slower than Intel and that's it, right? You don't know why. You don't, you don't look inside the, through benchmarking, you don't know why one is slower than the other. You know that one is slower than the other. When you're doing profiling, you're kind of digging into, like you're checking, is it the pipeline? Is it the decoding of the execution uh, instructions? What is the slowest part in IMD, right? And then the result is not a number. The result is the knowledge, right? So when we're doing profiling, uh, we learn what are the bottlenecks. So the, the end result of profiling is not a number. The end result of profiling is, uh, kind of understanding of where the bottlenecks are. Um, exactly. So uh, when we do profiling, we often do benchmarking at the same time because we want to be optimizing something and checking how much impact it has on the final result. So when we do profiling, we identify the bottleneck and then we do some tweaking and then we want to compare how much our tweaking helped 
So we combine profiling with uh, the, um, profiling with benchmarking very much, right? So we often do both at the same time. Okay, so now we come to debugging. What is debugging? What what is the the word debugging? What does that mean? It literally means removing bugs from the code, right? So debugging is removing bugs from the code. So yes, exactly, finding and removing bugs. And in your professional career, debugging is the most useless time spent in your life, right? Like searching for bugs and removing them. Like you probably notice that, like you, you probably hate that aspect, right? If you have a bug and you're spending 10 hours, 20 hours finding where the bug is and then finding it, of course, it's very gratifying. Like after 20 hours, you say, shit, I, I solved this, right? But you know, you have your code here, 20 hours later, it's exactly the same. It's just that you removed the bug. You, you didn't improve anything. You didn't progress anything. It's kind of like, it feels like a, a waste of time and it is a waste of time, right? So the point is that we try to minimize that. We try to minimize the time of looking for the bugs because it is kind of non-productive time. Like it doesn't actually uh, help with anything. It doesn't produce anything, but you can, we cannot eliminate it, right? It will always be there. There will always be some bugs and you will always have to spend some time on the on debugging. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make environments and compilers and everything and our procedures in such a way that to minimize the time spent on actual debugging, right? Uh, but debugging has some uh, additional features. So debugging is not exclusively to find and remove bugs, okay? So, why do we do debugging? So one, of course, is to find and fix bugs. But why, what else do we use debugging for? So with this, for example, with this uh, printouts or with setting up the, the breakpoint uh, and checking the, the values of variables, why do we do that? Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of um, trying to inspect the code. That's a good good suggestion. So I have. Um, so to have a working code. Uh, with reasonable performance and avoid crashes. Make sure the code is doing what we intended to do. Exactly, perfect. So those are very good uh, reasons. So I group them uh, into three categories, right? So the first one, which is the biggest one is finding bugs. The second reason is ensuring correctness, right? So we use debugging as a mechanism to ensure that the code is doing what it intends to do, right? Ensuring correctness. And then we often do it, and, and you do it a lot, um, to understand what the code is actually doing, right? Um, so as a learning tool. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with that, right? There is nothing wrong in setting up a breakpoint and kind of walking through the code to understand what the code is doing. but. As you grow as a programmers and as you go as you go into the uh, professional kind of uh, writing software, uh, understanding the code via debugging is time consuming and it is a little bit inefficient, right? So there are better methods for dealing with the last one um, and there are a little bit better methods to dealing with the second one as well. So let's let's look into those two apart from the setting up the breakpoints and uh, putting print statement. What else can we use to do those two things, right? So understanding the code. 
Well, you can kind of uh, do mental walkthrough, right? That's what we were doing as exercises before. We were staring at the code and trying to work out in our heads what's going on, right? Uh, and that one is pretty um, fast for some problems and it's frustrating and really tedious for some other, right? Uh, so no matter how much you would stare at this bind statement, if you don't kind of follow, if you don't click, you just have to go to the next one, right? Because you will not solve it, right? So even though this one is the fastest and the most efficient, uh, it doesn't work all the time. So sometimes as we did, we went to GHCI and we actually investigated what, what's going on, right? Um, there are two more, like you can actually write doc tests and that's what I usually do. I actually, before I write my function, I write the test for that function because then I see what do I expect as parameters and what I expect as a result, right? Um, it doesn't work for all the functions, of course. Like it only works for some functions and it only works for functions which are pure because if you mingle AI into it, then it, it gets problematic. Um, but then you can do some unit tests, right? So doc tests have some limitations. Most of those limitations are overcome by unit tests. But even with unit tests, there, there are some limits, right? So sometimes you cannot have doc tests and unit tests for everything. They will be parts of the code which you will have to either mentally walk through or use GHCI to kind of uh, investigate uh, yourself. So understanding code is like, like that. Um, and then ensuring correctness is exactly the same, right? We ensure correctness by checking if the code is correct, uh, checking with GHCI or doing doctors and blah, blah, blah. And those are the kind of recommended methods, right? So the recommended methods are use doctors to your advantage, uh, document the, the functions that you are using and do extensive unit tests. And this is better than doing breakpoints and checking variables because this stays with the code base. So you can always rerun it. Every, every modification or refactoring you do, the test will stay there and you can double check that everything is there just by clicking like rerun test button. If you have to go and set up the breakpoints and walk through your code over and over, every time somebody changes the code, you're wasting time, right? You're kind of uh, repeating your work, right? And repeating the work is uh, not beneficial. So everything which you can automate uh, versus some things that you can do with manual labor is beneficial in the long term. Um, as a student, you, your horizon is very short. Like you, you have two weeks to finish the assignment and then you're done with it and you kind of never touch it again, right? So the manual labor feels like uh, appealing, like it feels like it's a good way to uh, approach it, but, and it's fine. As, uh, as I said, I used uh, breakpoints and um, manual inspections a lot when I was studying, but when you start working and you have to maintain a code base for years, and if you have tasks which take, you know, half a year and you have to go back to it over and over again, um, Anything that requires manual labor, you want to eliminate, right? Completely, yeah. Like, can you, I'm not sure if there are any data in that for like actual testing stuff out there, but less specifically dedicated to be learning about testing. We could do that, yeah. We can, uh, we can have a session about like how to write tests and how to design your software, because this is super important. Um, the, so, so, sorry, yeah. Uh, I think we, we, we should do that. Um, so decomposing your problems into things that can of easily be tested uh, is, is a good thing. So maybe I will bring like a kind of a more complex uh, piece of code and we will work with it and see how we can kind of do that. Um, so automation is the king. Like uh, I was, um, I was on, on that side of spectrum a lot. Uh, but with a little bit of rigor and a little bit of a systematic approach, you can kind of migrate yourself completely to, to be doing things in an automated way. Um, so there is this whole movement of test-driven development where you actually don't start developing anything until you have tests. You, you write tests first, and then they all should fail because you're missing the implementations. So you're writing failing tests because you don't wrote the implementations yet. Then you're writing the steps, which will still make the test fail, but you will at least they will compile. And then you're writing the actual code. And you have this, once you finish the code, all your tests should pass, right? And that's the methodology for um, 
ensuring that you have kind of a good APIs and good test coverage. So we, we can uh, we can do the lab lab on that. So I personally, I almost avoid manual labor and only do it when I really have to, when everything else failed, right? So when all those things failed, um, then I go into manual labor, but if I have bugs, I write more doc tests or more unit tests. And I try to find bugs by writing more tests and testing more and more detailed things. Um, so instead of doing kind of debugging to find bugs, I'm kind of writing more and more specific tests. And then at some point I, I kind of know where the problem is, but all those tests stay with me, right? They stay with the code base. If I did debugging manually with setting breakpoints and so on, all this work is gone. Like after I found the bug, you know, all this work is kind of wasted. Yep. Well, can you show this later? A little bit of this in IntelliJ, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, it, it, no, it, it is. This is kind of independent of the um, of the ID that you use. Uh, so the ID only makes uh, um, difference for the actual manual uh, debugging. But for this automated debugging, you're using uh, Haskell tools, and they are independent of the of the ID that you use, right? Um, yeah. So there is no uh, no problem doing it with Vim or with uh, IntelliJ. The the whole the whole point is kind of uh, with the philosophy, uh, like doing um, debugging, right? So let's do this piece of code. Uh, for some of you, it will be easy because you wrote it. <laughs> uh, for some of you, it will be like, whoa, what's going on here, right? Uh, so uh, we take five from a list. And where a list is this? And this demonstrates, first of all, it demonstrates some difficulties debugging in Haskell, right? How would we debug this in Haskell? Where where would you put print print statement if you could? Like you can't, right? It's like super hard to kind of uh, uh, debug that using traditional breakpoint debugging. Like where would you set up a breakpoint? Um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you could if if it kind of um yeah, you if if you can do it that that would work. Um it is kind of a, a little bit complex piece of code, right? Um so normally if you have a complex piece of code. You can decompose it, so I don't um, I don't to spend um, the entire like remaining twenty minutes on on doing that. We probably will do it in the lab, but if I have a piece of code which I kind of don't understand, I first like I would copy the whole thing. So I first I would copy the whole thing in here, and I will say, okay, what is an a list? And it will tell me, well, it's an array of numbers, right? And it's like, yeah, I kind of see that. Like I concatenate zero and I concatenate one, and then I the, I have this magic happening here. So maybe I would say, okay, so let's do something else. Let's do, I'll have magic and the magic is this, right? Um, and then I see that it actually is a recursive definition because I have to have a list defined first before I can have magic. And then I have a list defined with the magic. So I, I cannot really decompose it. Like I, um, it's, it's sometimes you can, sometimes you can kind of split your more complex piece of code into individual chunks and that make make makes it easier for testing and for debugging. But in this particular case, it's a little bit tricky. So I cannot really define that without defining a list and a list I have defined as this, right? But what I can do, I can cheat a little bit, right? So let's comment that. Uh, let's comment that out. And let's define a list as a list which has zero and one. And then I will say an empty list, right? So you kind of understand this, that I'm doing a list up to that point, right? So now I have a, a small list with zero and one. So if I say, what's a list? 
and it says, well, Alice is zero and one, right? So there is no magic here anymore. Uh, and then I will use the code which I um, commented out and I will say magic. Okay, so then I have the magic. And then um, what I'm doing is um, concatenating a list with the magic. So it's like, uh, what is a list concatenated with magic, right? Um, I can try that. And it says, well, it's an extra one because it sort of uh, used my A list, which had two elements. And I can kind of uh, try to understand why I got this extra one by analyzing what this function is doing and what my initial list and the tail of the list were, right? So my initial list was zero one. Uh, and then my tail of zero one is just one. So if I'm zipping a longer list with a shorter one, that again assumes that you understand what zipping means, right? If you don't understand that part, then you have to kind of uh, walk through yourself what zip is doing, right? So you have to say what is zip with, right? And you have to understand that zip takes two lists and applies a function which combines elements from one and the second and produces a third list we sees after that function, like the combined function kind of walks through the, uh, the thing and the combining function in our case is a plus. So you have two lists and then we're doing that. So maybe we can do something like, like play with it, like zip with, and then we're playing with plus and we have a list which is one, two, and then we have another list which is like, you know, 10, 20. And then what we, would expect we would expect a third list with one plus ten and two plus twenty right and that's what we get so we kind of demystified what zip with is doing a little bit so you can kind of uh walk walk with this and wor work with this like by decomposing it right um so what take five does well take five you, you should know that like if you have a list so if i have my list let's make it longer so I have a list with four elements. If I say take two, it produces a list with two first elements out of that list. So it will be one, two. If I say take three, um, is this, right? Um, should I automate this? Like this is like uh, actually learning how things fun functions work, right? And should I, like, would I be able to learn this by playing with GTI or sh should I use like doc tests to learn about this? It's up to you, but some, time wasted on kind of learning, like it will stay with you because take will become kind of a function that you understand if you played with it and uh, zip with also. So then when you look at this code, you will be able to kind of do a visual inspection with take five, you kind of understand clearly what it's doing and with this one, right? Um, but the, the biggest challenge here is that it's a kind of a recursive definition and it's a declarative. Um, and this declarative definition you kind of need to walk through yourself, like how how it will build up, right? How the list, how the final list will be kind of a build up. And debugging it, like walking through, like a step by step is a good thing. So you can set the break breakpoint and kind of in, in inspect that, or you can make each recursive call somehow showing you what, um, what the list will be like. The problem with this particular line is that there is no recursive calls um, to, um, to a function because this one is not a function. Uh, this one is um, an expression and this expression is built up by this function, which kind of uh, reuses the expression uh, over and over again, right? Um, so this expression doesn't change it's kind of constant and this function reuses it. So even if we put a breakpoint here, the recursive calls will, will not work, right? The, they will work with some recursive uh, definitions, but in here, it's a little bit more magical than that. Like it's kind of declarative definition of what this list looks like by referring to it, but we will not, like the, the program doesn't work in an imperative way. There is no recursion going on here. 
it will not actually recourse to anything. It, it, it just builds it declaratively, uh, in, like internally via some loops, which you don't see, right? Um, so this is a single line of code, which is executed only once and there is no recursion, right? So setting up a breakpoint will kind of not really work for this particular case. Okay, so let's, um, yeah, so I already said that, uh, avoid uh, avoid debugging and uh, avoid manual labor. Uh, do, do doc tests and unit tests uh, instead as much as you can and use um, GHCI and mental workthroughs for understanding. So this is fine. Like wh when you spend time playing with GHCI and playing with those functions and checking the types, what are the types of those things and so on, that's fine because uh, you have to learn it. Like you have to acquire some, some understanding. Uh, so GHCI is okay for, uh, for understanding and mental, for mental work, work uh, walkthroughs. But what if I actually have a bug? I have a lot of tests and I actually have a bug and I have to find a bug, right? So I, I'm telling you not to do debugging, but if you really have to do debugging, right? What do you do? Well, uh, you know, why Haskell is difficult for debugging? Give me some. Yep. Are you often composing functions? So it's a lot of things. Yeah. So it's kind of a complex because we're composing functions. So functional aspects are difficult, right? So we have functional. What else? So functional. What else makes Haskell difficult to debug? Yeah, it's very compact. Um, so that is related to, uh, let's say, concise, related to it being functional. What else? Yeah, so compiler errors are not helpful sometimes, but that is um that is a reason why we have to do debugging right if the compilers were kind of helping us not to have bugs which they do most of the time um exactly this one is very good so cannot um cannot put print or print line uh everywhere we cannot do that why we cannot do that because most functions are pure and printing stuff out like violates the purity of the function. It involves IO and then, you know, things go to hell. Uh, so what else? So inability to use IO, that's a very good reason. There is one more big one. Yep. All right, so let's let's uh, review this. So Haskell is difficult to debug for many reasons. So the, the, this one, I it co actually contains all three reasons. Like I, I put that put that into a single reason, um, but it's lazy and it's declarative, right? Um, you cannot inspect things that haven't been evaluated yet because they haven't been used, so they don't have values. So a lot of time you want to show something, print something, and then it hasn't been evaluated yet. So it doesn't have any value, it's unknown. Uh, and also like we had with this, um, with this example, yeah, with this the example, this is a declarative piece of code. You cannot like iterate over it because it doesn't iterate itself. It, it, it's, it's just a declaration and it just happens. It's a single statement, right? So uh, Haskell is actually quite difficult. It doesn't mean that you cannot do it, uh, but you, you can do it, uh, but it's kind of hard. So how, how would you do that? Well, so my experience is every time I try to debug Haskell, I ended up not actually solving my problem and I hating the time spent on debugging because it was so much time consuming that I would be better off doing all the other things, right? So I do debugging sometimes and every single time I actually hated it, <laughs> right? Yeah, what, what, what do you want to say? Yeah. 
these parameters and run most of the functions out with the parameters. You can see that that's for most of the functions, it's not that easy to look into what the function actually does as a name. That's right. So there, there are two, uh, two core reasons uh, to do debugging in Haskell. One reason is you really need to do debugging and you want to find, and at the same time you're doing some profiling and you want to find some metrics of how things really work and where you can optimize. And then you need to go deeper. And for that reason, there, is, there are tools and there are kind of mechanics uh, for you going deep into like list comprehensions and things like that of how things are kind of um, actually done and evaluated, especially if you're not doing the strict evaluation, but you're doing kind of a lazy evaluation, right? But it's a, a rabbit hole, like uh, Per Morton would be doing that. If he was programming in Haskell, he would be doing that, right? So if the performance is of, is of essence, if you really need to optimize or find some uh, profiles, if you really need to optimize which to choose, like uh, should I choose a list or should I use an array and things like that, then you may need to go into that path, right? And then there is no other way. You have to go there and you will be doing using tools which allow you to do that. You will be using uh, debug stack traces. You will be doing kind of a proper debugging. It's super hard. It's a little bit of a black art in Haskell, right? Uh, so that's one reason. And I in this course, I discourage you doing that. So the second reason is you want to understand what the code is doing. And for that, there is a, a trace function, right? Uh, so the trace function is a function which kind of is a, a compiler add-on to your vocabulary. And it prints a string, which you say, say here, uh, and then it kind of returns the same value back. So, so the signature is a little bit confusing. Uh, so let, 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 let us see a, a quick example. Uh, we have six minutes, maybe we can manage that. So let's see, um, let's have a, um, let's have a, um, we can, we could do that really well for the uh, recursive calls. Um, so if I go back to, let's see quickly, if I go to our, Tutorial. So merge request and let's use uh, Oyston recursive uh, definition. So for example, if we doing those, um, yeah, so this one. So for some cases, like th this Fibonacci definition uh, is quite nice and you can easily, uh, relatively easily debug it with the trace function. So we would say, because here we're doing recursive calls, right? Every time we calling F, we're doing a recursive call. So what we can do is we can add additional uh, definition for F. Uh, so we could do this. Um, Usually you, you, you can do it in two ways. Uh, so I will show you the easier way first. So let's say um, we have a function, um, I don't know, fun, uh, which takes an argument uh, and it is like fun is uh, string to string. So fun takes an argument and um, says um, Bob, Oh, Marius, and then adds, uh, concatenates it with reverse X, okay? So we have this function, um, and then we want to debug it. We want to see what the function does. So then we want to put some printouts, like we want to print out what it actually did and what the parameter was, right? So we could, uh, we could use this trace function. So we could say trace, and now we are putting some sort of output of our choosing, like what we want to uh, um, what we want to print. So, for example, we say debug, um, and we can concatenate it with parameters. So we can, for example, for, uh, say x equals, and then we will print um, x is already a string, so we don't need show. So let's do this. 
And then we can say also, um, you could also say concatenate with result is, and then we would concatenate it with the body, which in our case is this one, right? So we would say, okay. Um, so this is what the, the string is. And then we need the actual body for the function, right? So I will kind of uh, copy that. Um, so we'll say, this is the body of the function. You already see why it gets tedious and why it, you kind of gonna hate this anyway. Um, and then um, you are kind of done, right? So we convert it. So your original function, so your original fun X was this. We actually commented it out. We wrote a new definition with trace and we left the body of the function as the last argument to the trace because then it's gonna do it, right? Um, so then if I, um, yeah, let me, let me copy that. So, we take this, okay, and we go to our favorite GCI. GCI, and we're gonna paste this. I'm gonna make it bigger. So it says, oh, I don't know what you mean with trace. Error message, helpful, not too bad. So we say we need debug trace and then we define it again right so we are missing some yeah let me show let me check so we have trace and trace is closing bracket for marius uh yeah so this is the yeah, so we need one closing, more closing bracket here. Come on. It died, the, the second screen just stopped working. All right, so it's 10 o'clock um, and I would need few more minutes to explain it. So let's postpone it until Thursday. Uh, and we will walk through uh, the recursive example and the kind of a non-recursive example and see how, what can be debugged and what cannot be debugged. So some of the declarative things cannot and some of the things like that can, but those which can typically are so simple that you kind of don't really need debugging for it. Uh, so. Yeah, my advice is probably, you're probably not gonna really use debugging in this course uh, because first of all, it's kind of too involved and a bit too hard. Uh, and second, it, it it is kind of a con you know time consuming. So my own personal experience is that I, I sometimes try it and every time I try it and go back to it, I kind of don't like it. And I try to do, to solve my problems in a different way, yeah. Say it again. Yep. Yeah, so what we will do, we will finish this. So it will be a little bit more uh, code review with the debugging. And then we will do the design of the mouse handling such that we will see what we need to consider. So we will kind of do the, the lab and walk through the lab. Uh, to kind of understand what choices can we make and how can it work uh, such that you end up with some working code. Um, it will probably be not exactly like last time that I give you some small tasks because SDL itself, I, I think we should repeat that. Yeah, so I think we will, we will do that. Um, yeah, so... 
Sounds good. So if I manage to decompose the SDL code into smaller chunks that we can do as an exercise, we will do it this way. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, online people. So just give me a second. I will. Um... Yes. Uh,